Welcome back to Investment 360. We're back with Glenn Silverman, the Chief Investment Officer of Investment Solutions. We've been talking about the, Glenn, the, the history, the situation that India finds itself in, and now we'd like to get a little bit more into the financial markets and the opportunities for investors. Uh, you've gone over there, I guess, a, quite an in-depth fact-finding mission to ascertain and, and get a feel for what's going on in the economy. Tell us a little bit about the history of the Indian stock market relative to the history that you've painted of the country in the first half of the interview. I think maybe just was a little bit of background which leads us to the stock market. Also, if we have a look at the last 50 years of British rule up until independence in 1947, the economy in India grew broad at 1%. From then until 1991, which was a really, really critical year in their history, it grew between 3 and 5 percent. So much stronger growth and independence, 1947 to 91. In 1991, India nearly defaulted. They were within weeks, if not days, of going to the IMF to bail them out, etc. And they had to reform the economy. So they say that India only reforms in crisis, and 1991 was therefore a great opportunity to them. They removed this license Raj. They stopped nationalizing and they started to privatize, etc. And from then we saw Indian growth start to reach between 5 and 7 percent, at times almost approaching the 10 percent type of mark, not so far off China. So we've seen since 1991 a, a much freer economy, and we've seen the benefits of that kind of coming through as well. If we look at the stock market specifically, the, the um, Bombay Stock Exchange has something like 5,300 listed companies. JC is sitting at four to 500. So dramatically more companies available, and you see it everywhere. There are literally tens of thousands of small and medium enterprises, some of them becoming larger, some of them listing, etc. So I think a wonderful opportunity to stock pickers in, in that country. You mentioned, though, that uh, in terms of the liquidity, the market doesn't trade as high as the JSC. Uh, there are some big uh, Indian names, Tata is one of them, uh, that are big by global standards. But have they got enough of the the really big companies to, to drive liquidity and, and investment into, into that uh, stock exchange specifically? Well, I'm not 100% sure. I haven't tried to analyze exactly why it is that, for example, I think South Africa's market trades something like three times as much on an annual basis. The Brazilian stock market, the Bovespa, eight times as much as the Indian market. So you have a lot more liquidity, bigger companies, etc. I guess it's part of the development there. They also have some kind of forms of exchange control in the country. So quite difficult still for foreigners to get into that market. As that tends to relax, I tend to think we will see you know, an uplift in terms of liquidity, etc. But, but the one stat which was absolutely fascinating to me, and, and a very strong investment theme that comes out of this is the number of 10 baggers that we saw in India. In other words, shares that have gone up tenfold. That number was, the, in the last 10 years, was higher in India than any other country in the world. The next highest, and there were 750 of those companies. The next highest was Korea at 72. So wonderful opportunities to those people who can actually you know, find the gems. 720 10 baggers, I think that, that would make any fund manager lick his, uh, lick his uh, chops through with interest there. Uh, what's the sort of opportunity now uh, for spe specifically your clients and investment solutions? How do you start approaching BRICS and the, especially the, the markets that you're excited about like India with regards to making uh, a presence in your portfolio? So I think it's a very, very good question, and, and one can approach this differently. And I guess the size of assets that you have under management and the flexibility you have in ma makes quite a big difference. Our approach has been the following. We pick managers with a global equity mandate. That means they can pick parts, shares based anywhere in the world. So we haven't gone for a regional approach. We haven't said we've got X percent in China, India, Brazil, and North America, etc. We have had that approach in the past. It's very complicated. Who decides how much? You often have countries that have wonderful stories behind them. The Indian story is a very good story. What about valuations? What about you know, whether it's already all priced in, etc. So our approach has been to very much go for global equity managers. However, what we found is those managers, and they're very good managers based in Edinburgh and London, New York in the main, tend to buy British, French, and American shares in the main. There's very little direct exposure to these up-and-coming 10 baggers, th those themes. And so what we did last year is we changed our benchmark away from MSCI World to the MSCI All Countries. And what that means, instead of having zero in emerging markets, our benchmark now has 13%. But since our managers don't own 13%, we put a passive component in to close out that gap. So we're neutral to that 13%, and we are now in a process of going to find 
global emerging market managers to replace it. We want active managers in the space, more than this space than any other, because you can find 10 beggars and other things. So that is the exercise that's underway. Uh, the, what, what, what's, and I'm interested to find out here, what, what's the experience been with investment solutions with regards to those investment managers that you will use uh, in a place as specialized and complex as India? Do you favor using a, a in-country manager there that would be a local Indian investment manager or do you favor using specialists that are outside but then you know you, you've got to really pay attention to the mandate because you you might not get that exposure that you want yeah we we think increasingly we just well the world is a very complex place we don't have the ability nor the desire to go and find regional managers in all different parts of the world one for Bang Bangladesh and one for Indonesia and one for India and one for China etc so we are only looking at guys who have a global emerging market portfolio now, if they choose because they see the opportunities either top down or bottom up in India and have a big weight in there, fantastic. And if they feel not, then as long as we rate them highly as a good manager, I'm very comfortable. So we certainly will not insist that they have to take um, any particular. And again, Brazil, we came back with a very positive view on the country, deep resources, etc. The stock market has done terribly. So, you know, you've got to be very, very cautious. Our approach, therefore, is going to pick these global emerging market managers and let them decide where they wish to. But there's a difference. At least picking an emerging market manager, they will buy emerging market stocks. If you give it to a global equity manager, they may or may not do that. They'll buy a lot of Nestle with the argument that Nestle sells into these countries, but you may not get the direct exposure. Clinic, the capital centers in the world, in the New York, London, Singapore, Hong Kong, uh, very English-speaking, English-dominated. Does the fact that a fund manager can pick up an annual report in English in India make it any more attractive or easier for him to invest there than perhaps going to a place like Brazil? I think it does. I think it would make sense that it would. The, the, the common business language in the world certainly is English, and I think there is an advantage to that. I mean, I'd certainly, for example, contrast that maybe to a Chinese annual report written in you know, Mandarin, that might be a hell of a lot more difficult for any kind of global investor to, to have a look at. But guys who are running global equity portfolios or global emerging market portfolios have to deal with these complexities. One gets a sense they travel quite extensively. They often have those nationals within their team. So they have a Mandarin speaking person in the team or Portuguese speaking, etc., etc. So, you know, good global managers are going to have to deal with the complexities of this world. Just in terms of uh, that, and, and just to maybe move the discussion a little bit sideways here and just look at the South, the South African investment industry, obviously you know, you're very, very familiar with it. We've seen one or two companies really starting to open their offerings up uh, and become, as for instance, at the Coronation, a specific emerging market fund has been launched there and it's, it's been run very well. Uh, Investec has gone more into developed markets. Uh, do you think that there's an opportunity for, for our investment managers to, to broaden their horizon a little bit? And are you seeing that? Yeah, definitely. So we're certainly seeing, we, we, it's interesting, we're seeing certain managers niching their businesses a, a lot more. I uh, just returned from seeing all the major CEOs and COOs of major asset managers two weeks ago in Cape Town. There's small houses, a, a Taconta, a relatively unknown house that focuses very much in the money market space. 70 odd billion under management. That's not, you know, that's big money. That's kind of you know, the investing strategy, which I think actually is much more centered on emerging markets and in particular now frontier markets. Again, quite excited about the more esoteric space. And you're right, Coronation running a very successful emerging market portfolio. So actually, we're seeing managers doing all. Some are going much more global, some are much being much more niched, some are finding great opportunities in fixed income space, others in kind of, you know, global equity, local equity and actually quite a lot in you know, pushing hard in the unlisted space as well. And I know certainly in Africa that's, that's one of the focuses we've heard John Oliphant talking about using private equity to access some of the unlisted companies that are operating on the, on the, uh, uh, on the continent. In terms of uh, the, the strategy now, if you tie that in, I think you said that you've got about a 13% exposure uh, directly through to emerging markets and you, you use passive strategies to top that up. Is that, does that get you to around 30% uh, of, of the portfolio in your equity mandates now in, in emerging markets? No, so what it would have done is our managers probably are about 5% naturally exposed. So we topped that up to 13. So we added another 8% passive. But that passive is going to go. We will replace in the next few months by an active strategy. Coronation is one of the managers we're considering, but we actually have a lineup. There are about 30 managers we've seen globally. My, the team in London has been spending a lot of time with them. I leave in April for a trip to see a whole lot of managers with quite a big team. There's five of us going, and we're going to come back and hopefully conclude in 
who we're giving the money to. Okay, great. Just I think, just then to tie it in for a retail investor, how do they think about this? I mean, obviously they've, they, they, they might be invested in investment solutions, uh, fund of funds. Um, what should, how should a retail investor, when he's looking at his portfolio, think about an emerging market exposure? Yeah, you know, these are. I keep wondering whether there's a holy grail in what we do, and the answer is there isn't. You know, there's approaches that work at different periods of time. I met an individual this last weekend who is a very wealthy individual and travels to India and spends three or four weeks there and can meet individual companies. To that guy, he can go and buy individual shares within India. To others, they might want to look at some of the kind of regional, if you really like the Indian theme, for example, find managers locally and globally. There are a lot of them that run Indian portfolios. To me, that's very complicated, and there'd be a very small proportion of retail investors who can do it. If they invest in our portfolios, we're taking care of that. We set a strategy that incorporates this, that I think is sensible, which is very global. We managers who I think are the best position to make the calls. Do I want to be in this region, in this sector, in this company, can make that call or not? Um, and to the rest, maybe, you know, stick with, you know, the big global equity portfolios and let those managers gain exposure in, in a more diverse, d diversified fashion. It's been a very successful way to manage money. Again, I don't want to pick on Nestle or Unilevers or the Proctors and Gambles, but that hasn't been a bad strategy as well. There's a hell of a well-run companies with very strong brands and strong cash flows, and if they are gaining exposure, let them deal with the currency turmoil and the you know, the politics that does come with the emerging market exposure, etc. So I would say as long as you understand your strategy, I think actually all have, have merit. Okay, great. Glenn, we're going to have to leave it there. And thanks again for your time.